for all the people that are out there. Chapter 3 of this book. Listen, I want to tell you, man, I was not surprised that this book became a bestseller. Let me tell you why. I knew what it took to be a bestseller. I knew how many copies we need to sell. Uh, We had some big, big bulk orders, people ordering 200, 300 copies at a time. And when you hit a number, it's almost like Jim Collins talked about on Good to Great, is is it, it's the flywheel and the doom loop, man. You're driving, you're driving, you're driving, you're driving, and then the dam, the dam breaks. And Well, that's what happened on the book, is that we were out there selling the book, selling the book, pre-selling the book. We had hundreds of pre-sales, and, um, and they all hit this weekend. A lot of those hit this weekend, which, which caused Amazon to sell out. So the book was actually temporary out of stock. And all, all of you who bought the book, they were already shipping those books to you. But on day number one, we're out of books, man. So I called my publisher. I said, what's the deal? And the publisher said, we shocked the system. They, they didn't order enough books, although we told them you were going to sell it out. So what did I learn? I learned how to make a book a bestseller, how to make a product a bestseller, and everything that comes along with that. So today we're talking Chapter 3. Thank you for buying the book. The title of this chapter is Grieving Your Lost Potential is Where Action Starts. Grieving Your Lost Potential is Where Action Starts. Now, here's what I mean by that. There is a, there is a cycle of accountability that looks like this. We all start with good intention. We fail to follow through and fall off the wagon. And then we experience guilt. The guilt is associated with grieving something. What are we grieving? We are actually grieving the loss of our potential. It's where regret comes from. Regret is I should have taken action. I could have taken action, but I did not take action. I was capable. I had the goods. But something held me back. Okay? So what happens is I start out of the gate strong. I have some kind of kryptonite, fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, fear of something. I fall off the wagon. I feel guilty about it, and I, and I go through this cycle over and over and over and over and over. So I go dynamic, then I get static, and then I feel entropic, and I feel guilty about it. I actually believe that grieving your lost potential is where, is where action starts. When you grieve your lost potential, then you start seeing these non-refundable seconds, these non-refundable minutes that you can't get back, and you start going, I'm going to get my shit together, man, okay? I'm going to get my act together because I don't want to grieve my lost potential anymore, right? And sometimes, many times, it takes the help of another person get coming along and going, look, let's go. You got potential. You got the goods. Why aren't you taking action? And I even say in the book, at the end of your life, you know, the, 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 the book Five Regrets of the Dying, Bronnie Ware actually spent time with people in the last 12 weeks of their life, and they all had similar regrets. And she chronicled these regrets and wrote the book, The Five Regrets of the Dying. It's a very tough book to read. But one regret that it was not on there that I'm like, I cannot believe that's not on there, is I could have, I should have, but I didn't. That was not a regret. Okay, that was not a regret. So at the end of your life, you may regret many things. I put in the book, you wish you had spent more time with your family. You wish you wouldn't have worked so hard or spent many hours in office. You wish you would have been introduced to God earlier in life. You wish you would have lived the life you really wanted. That was one of the regrets of the dying, by the way, is I always lived my life based on what other people wanted me to do, not what I wanted to do. I think one of the greatest regrets in life is not finding your talent in life and and exploiting that talent to push out there in the world and, and make the world a better place. I don't know what your agreement with the planet is. I've said this to you many times. I don't know what your agreement with the planet is. Only you know what your agreement with the planet is. Only I know what my agreement with the planet is. So for you, the grief is associated with grieving. What am I grieving? My lost potential. Why do I have lost potential? Because I false start. I fall off the wagon. And I don't have the guts to fight through it. So this is a constant cycle, man. We all live it. This is why we need accountability. This is why we need a coach in our life. And so for you, I want you to think about your potential, which is just kinetic energy that's stored until utilized is up here, and you're playing right here, right? You you, you got a potential up here, 
but you're playing right here. And this gap is absolutely driving you crazy. But it's driving you crazy so much that you're ready to do something about it. You're ready to get up, get off the mat, get in the ball game, And that's really what grieving your lost potential is. So what I'm saying here is, is I need you to grieve your lost potential. I need you to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I need you to get sick and tired of being average. So then in chapter 3 is really how do I help you get this straight and then how do I move you to much higher levels of production and performance? For me personally, I see grieving or lost potential as this. All your life you go for recognition, not impact. All your life you let other people define you in a way that's non-threatening to them. All your life you've listened to family or friends keep you in a box or tell you not to stretch. All your life you've been intimidated by others. All your life you had dreams, but you didn't pursue them. Okay? So potential's relative. Potential's relative, man. Most people, here, here's a good definition of potential. You ain't there yet. I'm not there yet. We ain't even close to our potential. I see people playing at very high levels, and I say, are you close to your potential? Are you self-actualizing? What do they say? Nah, I ain't even close. You're looking at them going, dang, man. If you ain't close, I ain't even close. So here's what happens. You waste time and impact because you don't prepare appropriately. Opportunity comes, but you ain't ready for it. You hold back so you don't hurt other people's feelings. That's a big one in the South. You allow other people to define you, and you play small versus playing big. I was reading in the Bible just the other day. Uh, as Paul in Corinthians, I think, or Timothy, and he was basically saying, man, quit playing small. You're not hardwired to play small. You're hardwired to play big, but you're playing small. You're hardwired to play offense, but you're playing defense. You're hardwired to take dominion, but you're letting people take dominion over you. And so I got to get you to this point that, that, that how do I shift from this defensive mobility in my life, or defensive posture, to offensive mobility? How do I live aggressively? How do I live more aggressive toward my goals? And uh, you guys know I was at the 10X Growth Con this weekend, and all of those speakers had one thing in common. All of them. They all live aggressively. None of them were on that stage that held back, softly pushed. They all exert enormous amounts of energy and push. So in this book, I talk about how to become a legendary creature. And when I started coaching John Floyd, uh, John Floyd was worth $50 million when he hired me to work with him and his company. He was a former Kroger manager that swept the floor for a living. He watched infomercials at night about real estate, and he got the bright idea to begin buying one little rental property every six months. He eventually said, I'd like to build houses, affordable houses. He eventually said, I want to develop subdivisions. And so when I started coaching him, he was worth $50 million. And at some years, he sold 777 homes a year, sometimes 40 a week. He became a legendary creature. He became a legendary creature that dominates a market. Why? Saw an idea, saw a trend, capitalized on it, took action, started small, took steps, long obedience toward in the same direction, wakes up X number of years later worth 50 million bucks. So I talk about to become a legendary creature, there's five things you got to do. All this is in chapter three of the book if you got it. Number one, and I hear this a lot and I tell people this, you got to pick a space and you got to own a lane. You got to pick a lane and you got to own a space. Okay, this has been very hard for me because I get distracted. I'm out there all over the place. I'm interested in so many things. But after 10 or 12 years of doing this, I pick a space. I want 250 people in Monster Producer. I want 250 people in my Total Growth Academy. I want four companies I'm coaching at 100,000 apiece. You see what I'm saying here? I want a best-selling book. I get, I get clarity about my target. I want to become America's coach because most people are not coaches. They're speakers or trainers or celebrities. I want to be America's coach, and I think I'm qualified to be that. So what have I done? I picked a space, and I've got a clear position, and my position is everybody needs a good coach in life. Okay? Then I'm going to, I'm going to become world-class through real experience of doing it. I'm going to do it over and over and over and over and over and over. I'm going to practice and recalibrate. See, the reason you need to have 10 conversations a day is not because you're going to sell 10 people. It's because you need to get better selling. 
the reason you need to go out and speak, like I had a guy call me recently and say, man, I want to do what you do. I want to speak. I'm like, look, go work for a seminar company, which is where I started. I did 60 seminars in two years, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sometimes there were five people there, ripped screen. They paid me 250 bucks a day. Here's what I said. Go do that for two years. Then you'll be ready to speak. Because what you're going to learn, how to entertain people for six hours, how to develop enormous amount of content. you got to become world-class through doing it. You don't become world-class by thinking about it. You don't become world-class by dreaming about it. You don't become world-class. You become world-class by, by, by experiencing it, by making 100 phone calls a week, by, by speaking all the time, by getting yourself in the game. So all the people watching, the real estate agents, everybody, second thing you got to do once you got a clear position is, man, you got to become world-class. Now, Third one is hard for people. You got to package and sell the process you have created. Packaging is very hard for most people. Packaging is very hard for most people. And that is taking thought and, and packaging your intellectual property into something that you can sell. Okay? So when I package this book... I am packaging what's in my brain into something you can consume. Now I've packaged it into a webinar, and I've packaged it into Online Academy, and I've packaged package it into Audible, and I've packaged it into this. i gotta, I got to create a lot of products. But, but here's where a lot of people get up. I know what space I want to own. I know what I want to say. I don't have enough practice doing it. I don't know how to package and sell it. So what's happening is I don't have enough distribution. I don't have enough products to push out to the market. So look at what I've done. I've developed a $24 product, a $99 product in my online academy, a $199 product, a $399 product, a speaking engagement that's $10,000. I'm creating enough products to hit everybody. I got a product for everybody. So you come to me and say, I ain't got any money. Well, you got enough money to buy the book. It's $24. And if you ain't got that much money, you can watch me on YouTube for free. And if you like it enough, you'll pony up the money. Because my goal is to be so good for my clients that they feel compelled to want to exchange money for the value I create. Anybody see that? So I'm picking a space. Mine's everybody needs a coach. I want to be America's coach. Number two, I'm becoming world-class because I'm doing it over and over and over and over. Number three, I'm packaging and selling the recipe. You can bake the cake or you can sell the recipe. Now listen, you can't sell the recipe if the cake ain't any good. <laughs> Somebody said, you just want your cake and eat it too. Well, what's the purpose of having the cake if I can't eat it? I do want my cake and eat it too, don't you? But here's your problem. You ain't got a good enough cake to sell yet. If you ain't got a good enough cake to sell, you can't sell the recipe. See, now that I've driven a million dollars of revenue, and this year I'll do $2.4 million of revenue, then we'll do $5 million of revenue and $10 million of revenue, now I can come to you and say, look, Amanda, I'm going to take you from zero to $10 million. And here's how I did it. See, I couldn't, I couldn't do that until I actually did it, right? Number four, big one. So remember, I'm grieving my lost potential. It's time to get my butt up and in gear. I got something special to sell, and I'm going to sell it to the whole world. I'm selling to planet Earth, not Nashville. I'm selling to the world, man. This is my bigger think. I'm, so, I'm, I'm chasing blue marlins versus blue gill. I'm attracting them, actually. Number four, I got to get this message out on the road. I got to get this. Look, look at all the greats, man. Jesus had to take his message out on the road. Paul had to go from city to city and get his message out there. All the great people. Why do all the entertainers have to go out on the road and, and perform? Why, do the, why is Donald Trump flying around the country doing rallies? You know why? Got to, get, got to overcome obscurity. He's got to get out there and get much, much, much. He's got to get support. So why do you think I'm speaking at lunch and speaking at breakfast, speaking in Minnesota? Why do you think I'm doing all that stuff? Because i got to get my message out to the planet. And you won't have the guts to do it if you don't believe in the message. So you got to overcome obscurity with what? Multiple strategies. So I suggest 10 strategies, a minimum, of pulling levers. 
you know, I was in Minnesota yesterday working with a company that's launching a new product. And uh, I just told him, man, you, you ain't got enough strategies. I'm going to just tell you. You need to sell it, sell it, and resell it. You need to hit it, hit it, hit it again. Hit the list, man. Hit your list. Number five, completely saturate your local market and box out the competition. Dominate the backyard before you dominate the whole yard. So how do you dominate your local market? Frequency, high touch, high intensity, consistency over and over, right? So let me stop right there and see if anybody's got any questions. What are we talking? Are you grieving your lost potential yet? If you're not, you ain't serious. Your potential, I always said, uh, God's gift to use your potential, your potential, your gift back is activating it. Until you're grieving your lost potential, you ain't serious. I want you to be serious about your potential. I want you to grieve your lost potential. Okay? So anybody have any questions that you'd like to type into the chat? At this point. Okay. All right. Now, fast forward just a little bit in the book. And I talk about becoming a must-have versus a nice-to-have. I, I got to get you understanding the difference between an asset and a liability. Assets add. Liability subtract. Assets add what? Time, energy, money, chemistry, trust, knowledge, likability. I call it immediate asset. How fast can you show another person that you can bring something to them that they don't have? See, what if I sum you up as a liability? You know what that means? I've made up my mind about you. You're going to cost me something. Time, energy, money, attitude. So in the book, I talk about how do you become a specialist. Think specialist, not generalist. Think hard surgeon versus general practitioner. Heart surgeon, general practitioner. Number two, solve major problems through your talents. Knowledge, creativity, nobody else can solve. Your talent, their need. Number three, create unique, differentiated, and original points of view. Covey used to say when two opinions are the same, one of those opinions is unnecessary. Why do I need you if you're going to tell me the same thing everybody else told me? Or you're going to tell me the same way everybody else told me? I need you to bring something unique and differentiated. This, if you're going to be a must-have, that's what you got to do. Number four, you got to get results nobody else can get. You got to get results nobody else can get. And number five, you got to become well-known. Listen, the concept of becoming famous means you are well-known, you are celebrated, you are validated, you are affirmed. All right? If, if you do those five things, you're going to be a must-have. All right? We got a question. What's the question, Jack? The question is from Amanda. It's what if you work for a company that doesn't allow some of the strategies on social media, et cetera? Yeah. Here's what I tell people. Are you in an environment you can thrive or not? If you're not in an environment you can thrive, you've got to find an environment you can thrive. I retired at 31 years old, Amanda, from coaching at, 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 at a, because I didn't think I could grow anymore. Static environment. I didn't want to be in a toxic environment. I said, look, I'm not going to let you control my future. I don't like working here. I don't like the energy. Okay, I don't like some of the people. I don't like the lid. I've already done everything I can do. What else is there to do here, man? I'm out of here. you got to put yourself in a position to prosper, Amanda. That's what I tell you. Never put your future or destiny in another person's hands. Never. Okay? All right. How do you know, how do you know when you're becoming must-have? Number one, people want an exclusive partnership with you. <laughs> you know you're good when people say, yeah, I heard Tim Grover speak this weekend, who was a personal coach of Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Here's what he said. Michael Jordan told Michael Jordan would not let him work with any other NBA athlete for six years. Jordan said, I'm not paying you to train me. I'm paying you not to train anybody else in the NBA. Isn't that good? God. Why is Tony Robbins coaching Paul Tudor Jones? Been coaching him for 20 years. Pays him a million dollars a year to be his coach. What if he says, look, I'll pay you five million, but you can't coach any other financial advisor except me? This is where I'm going in the future, by the way. I'm going to go to the mortgage companies I work with, and I'm going to say, look, I'll give you an exclusive 
I'll be your secret weapon. I won't work with anybody else except you. Here's how much it costs. And if you're willing, let's do an exclusive. Number two, you ask for and get the fees you want without negotiating. We live in a, a, a negotiation economy. How do you know your must-have? You ask for it and you get it. It's that simple. They say we can't live without you, man. When you create unique value, they can't live without you. Number three, you're in high demand from a very specific client list. You're not in low demand, you're in high demand. Number four, you're picking and choosing who you work with. <laughs> Number five, when budgets are cut, lots of things are cut, but you ain't cut. Now, how do you know when you're a nice to have? Number one, you're constantly having to fight for relevance. You're constantly having to negotiate your fees. When you help clients get superior results, they don't, they don't give you credit. They say, we could have done this without you. Number four, you take on every client who calls. It's got a pulse because you, you need the money. Number five, the, the word budget comes up in discussions. Well, we just don't have the budget. We don't have the budget for you, right? When you become so valuable, they will make room in the budget for you. Trust me. They'll say, look, we can eat bologna sandwiches. We can cut out this. We're not going on company. We got to have you. And somewhere in the book, I tell this story of Ram Sharan. Ram Sharan was on an airplane coming in. He's a very famous consultant. And I flew into Nashville with him from Chicago. And he got off the plane, and there were armed guards there to protect him. And I'm sitting there thinking, why does he have? Most people didn't know who he was. I knew who he was because I'm kind of nerdy that way. But they didn't know who he was. Then it hit me. The dude is so valuable. They don't want anything to happen to him. You're right? The dude is so valuable, they don't want anything to happen to him, man. So they gave him security guards. That don't mean somebody's going to come up and shoot him. That just means, look, don't let him stump his toe. What's, he's got something up here that's incredibly valuable. Don't, don't let anybody mess with it. We need that. So one more thing I'm going to share with you. When we talk about distribution of your message, you, to, to, to articulate to the market that you are an expert, you have to distribute and push out to the market in a number of different ways. And I put these in the book. Number one, I do showcase events, which are marketing events where I speak at little or no fee to get in front of people. And I want to ask you this question. What's your best means for generating customers? What is your best means for generating customers? If it's getting in front of people, then guess what you need to do? Get in front of people. So I do showcase events. Obviously, you know I do a ton of social media. What am I trying to do? Attract you. Attract you. I need to be doing more videos. I need to be pushing harder. I need to be creating more content. So I'm doing Facebook Live every night. I did two Facebook streams today. I'm doing almost a stream a day every day because I, I want to feed more people in the funnel. I want to attract more people. Number three, I write a weekly ad in our local newspaper in a key spot in the business section. I went to them and said, I'll give you the content. You give me the spot. Here's the deal. You can't let any other business person do it except me. So look at the strategies I'm using. I'm speaking out there a lot. I'm, I'm in the local newspapers, right? I'm trying to saturate my market. I'm doing the graffiti ads in the men's and women's bathrooms. I'm using a database and text message system. I'm doing podcasts and interviews. I'm doing weekly blogging. I mean, look at all this stuff we're doing, man. What are we trying to do? Attract. 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 So that feeds into this concept of completely saturating your local market. And when you completely saturate your local market, you are at the top of mind because of your consistent frequency that you have. So let's backtrack what I talk about in this chapter for you. Number one, wanting to be great starts by not wanting to suck. <laughs> what, what have you heard people say? I hate losing more than I love winning. I hate losing more than I love winning. I ain't grieving my lost potential, man. I ain't doing it. Life is too short to grieve potential. Now that, now, now that I, I'm grieving my potential and I'm serious about my life, I'm tired of messing around, now I want to become a legendary creature. How do I become a legendary creature that uses multiple skills to dominate a market? Well, I do those five things I told you. Okay? Now I'm packaging and selling. Now I'm pushing. Now I'm getting the word out. Just remember this. Your marketing philosophy should be simple. I see your name everywhere. Everywhere I go, I can't get away from you. So you must be doing something right. That's what this chapter is about. 
It's about those five things and how to push out to the market to become a legendary creature because you don't want to grieve your lost potential. Now, let's do some Q&A here. At the very end of every chapter in the book, I do a little Q&A. These are common questions that people ask me. Number one, I feel myself becoming complacent, static, and don't have the drive to become a legendary creature. What do I do? I should have just put it in there, Jack. You screwed. You screwed, man. But I didn't put that in there. Here's what I put in the book. In my experiences, only a very small percentage of the population want to become a legendary creature. The 1% is the 1% for a reason. I ain't talking about 1% of earners. I'm talking about 1% of performers. Do you know how cool it would be to be the personal coach of Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade? Is that the 1%? So here's one thing they told me. They had their stat sheet that the team judged them by, and when they came to him, they had a different stat sheet of personal things they wanted to accomplish within the context of the team. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, man. So they're measuring based on points, rebounds, field goal percentage. Jordan said, that ain't how I measure myself. I measure myself on this stat sheet that you don't even know about. Only me and my coach know that. So why? Do, so 1%. I want to be in the 1%. I want to create so much value that people said, look, I'll exchange my money for your value. Legendary creatures grieve their lost potential, by the way. They want impact versus recognition. Either Some people think either you have this gene or you don't. I wrote that in the book. I don't know if I believe it or not. I think it's a little bit of nature, a little bit of nurture. I don't think I popped out of the womb, you know, saying I want to be great. Um, I don't know. But somewhere along the way, I was turned on to greatness. Right? I, I was, I was my, my little meter was activated. Okay? And it has a lot to do with your environment, by the way. A lot of my early coaches that pulled this out of me. Okay? So at some point, you got to say, you want a good life or you want to go to the next level? You want comfort or you want impact? I'm more interested now in my legacy than I am in recognition. Number two, I'm having a hard time picking a position because I'm good and interested in many things. How do I narrow it down? I suffer from this too. It's called monkey mind. It's where your mind jumps around, jumps around, jumps around. I think, there's, I think the way you get clarity is you do a lot of things and then you say, this is it, right? Like I do a lot of things throughout the week. I do strategy and I do coaching and I do promotions and I speak and I do podcasts. But if you say, coach, pick one, what is it? What's the lane you want to own? Is it coaching? Is it speaking? Is it training? Is it podcast? What's the one thing you wanted to do? And, and you forced me to do the one thing that I wanted to do? It would probably be coaching with people that want to be coached. You know, I spoke at a luncheon today. Half the people didn't want to be coached. So I had to work real hard, real hard, because it was such a static group of people. And I'm sitting there going, man, I ain't looking for these bozos. I ain't looking for these people. I'm looking for three or four people in here that want greatness. Last question. I have a packaging problem. I'm that real estate agent who's good but can't seem to communicate it to the world. What do I do? All progress starts by telling the truth, number one. I want you to think of packaging as this. It is anything the consumer can feel, touch, taste, smell. I'm not opposed at some point in my career to having a full-time designer that can take my ideas and package them up. See, this stuff behind me is packaged up. This is a packaged up. Packaging is anything the consumer can feel. This is packaging. Okay. Packaging is anything that consumer can feel, touch, taste. Well, here's the deal. We got to take what's in your brain and we got to get it on paper and we got to package it to sell it. Video is packaging. Audio is packaging, right? This is how we help you get better. And so if you can't package up your stuff, man, you stay obscure. We got clients that are really, really good, but nobody knows it because they can't market it and sell it. They can't package it up. So packaging to me is so critical to you becoming great because... I wish we could package and sell things at a much rap, much faster pace than what we do. I need to come up with ideas and push them faster to the market. Here's what's cool about my buddy Cardone. You know this 10X event I went to this weekend? He decided right in the middle of the conference that he was going to sell next year's conference. <laughs> so from the moment he made a decision, it was already on the Internet selling tickets within minutes at 15000 he said, look, I want to do this again next year. 
hit internet department, bam, on it. Emails out, bam, right in the middle of the event. He was at working at such a speed and frequency. I'm like, man, this is awesome, man. I got to do that. I need my own internet department. I need my own graphic designer right there with me. So when I come up with an idea, because it's speed to sell, see, how fast can we push it out and sell it? <clears throat> how fast can we get videos out? How fast can we get podcasts? How fast? It's speed. And real-time internet gives us the ability to do that, okay? All right, guys, I got time for one or two questions. So if you got any questions for me, now's the time to ask them. If you're not in our big coaching programs, here's what I'm going to ask you. Why not, man? Have you seen enough to make a decision? <laughs> I was thinking about all the value we gave away on this book to, to make it a bestseller. And to our credit, we, we did it, man. We gave away the value, the webinars, the five hours, the, the audibles, the whatever, man. I said, whatever we got to do to make it a bestseller, whatever it takes, I'm in. So what, if you have any questions, go ahead and put your questions in the chat box right now. I'll be happy to answer. I got time for two questions. Then I got to go to church with my family. I don't want to give them crumbs. I want to go take pour it all in but have some left over for my, ki for my girls. Any questions? All right, no questions, guys. Listen, thank you for coming back. You know I'm doing, with, doing one of these on every chapter of the book. Thank you for making it a bestseller on Amazon. And um, I think we sold another 175 or 200 copies a day. And uh, listen, it ain't easy selling the book, man. What, what you got to do is write a book to solve a problem. What, what problem does this book solve? It, it solves this concept of introspection. You need another person looking at your life. You need another person challenging you like I'm challenging. You need another person pushing you. Okay, as Les Brown said, you got greatness in you. We just got to pull it out, baby. And if you get knocked down, if you can look up, you can get up. Ain't that right? So I want to thank you guys. Everybody needs a coach in life. God bless you. Thank you for making this a best-selling book. If you're not in our big coaching programs, why not? If you're not at least in our Total Growth Academy, can you tell me why not? Because you need to be, man. You need to be at least getting coached every single day. Imagine getting it every day. If you're interested in that, raise your hand. Send us an email. If you want to come see me live at the Greatness Factory, come see me. But I, I, I can get you to the next level if you just raise your hand and say, I want to go there. God bless you guys. Everybody needs a coach in life. That, my friend, was Chapter 3. <laughs>